Wales, the last stronghold of the Red Kite. The majestic raptor persecuted in Britain to the brink of extinction, until just a few breeding pairs remained in the upland valleys of mid Wales. But great efforts were made to return the kite to the skies of the UK in what has been hailed as a true conservation success story. And now, things are a little different. Feeding garden birds is a favourite pastime enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people up and down the UK, with around 60% of households regularly feeding their garden visitors. Each year, UK residents spend an estimated 200 to 300 billion pounds on supplementary bird food, allowing them to connect with nature whilst providing a healthy supplement to local bird populations. When we think of garden birds, however, most would picture scenes of small passerine birds fluttering around the feeders, feeding on a typical diet of mixed seeds, peanuts and sunflower hearts. The provision of meat, however, is not what one would typically consider as a common supplement. Nevertheless, up and down the country it's becoming more and more commonplace. Their target? The red kite. Feeding red kites in your garden would have been inconceivable just a few decades ago. For the red kite has had a turbulent history here in the UK. Once thought to be the UK's most common and widespread raptor, the red kite could be found across all of Great Britain as well as the larger offshore islands. Regarded as a valued scavenger for clearing the streets of London of discarded human waste and carrion, the red kite was awarded protection by royal decree. Such was their popularity that William Shakespeare made reference to them in a number of his plays referring to London as the City of Kites and Crows, and when the kite builds, look to your lesser linen, in reference to the red kite's habit of stealing underwear to build a nest. Something unexpected in skinny dippers have been finding out the hard way in Scotland. After a change in public perception, the royal protection was short-lived, with bounties being paid for the carcasses of kites that were seen as a pest to rural farm communities. New vermin laws imposed by Henry VIII decreed that any animal that was seen as competition to the production of food in England should be declared as vermin, and such was the fate of the Red Kite, which saw decades of persecution under the Tudors. By the 1800s, populations were in steep decline, and Red Kites were thought to be extinct in many areas of England and declared extinct in Scotland by the 1890s. With new threats emerging from taxidermy, air collecting and firearms, Red kites were persecuted until only a small number of breeding pairs remained in the remote upland valleys of mid Wales by the 1900s. Early conservation efforts began in Wales way back in 1882, with Edward Cambridge Phillips using his social influence among wealthy landowners to discourage the destruction of red kite nests on their land. Many small local initiatives followed, but the commercial demand for egg collecting which provided a month's salary for many locals was just too strong. This combined with an outbreak of rabbit myxomatosis in the 1950s, so populations of red kite continued to decline. The situation became so dire that even the army were drafted in to help. Two soldiers from the SAS spent several weeks hiding in the remote woodland valleys of Wales, protecting the last few remaining nest sites. But all hope was not lost and in the late 1980s, an ambitious plan was put in place to reintroduce the kite to areas outside of Wales. Thanks to the hard work of conservationists, the red kite has made a dramatic return to the skies of the UK. To find out more about the release project, I went to speak to author and ornithologist Ian Carter. Good morning, Ian. Thanks very much for joining me. 
So the story of the Red Kite has been hailed as a true conservation success story, and you were very lucky to be involved in one of the early release projects. Can you tell me a little bit about the project that you were involved in? Yeah, I was involved in the in the 90s. I think it started 1995, um, and it was about getting a population established in the Midlands in Northamptonshire. And yeah, so the project was carried out over about five years, and each year we'd release sort of 15, 20 young red kites into the wild, um, collected as nestlings from, from stable populations in, in Spain. Uh, and yeah, they were kept in pens for a, six to eight weeks, released into the wild, monitored quite closely yeah. uh, in order to try and get that, that, that new red kite population established. So was that release project a success? And how are the birds doing in that area and at the other sites throughout the UK? Yeah, they're doing great. I mean, they've they've done really, really well, better than I think anyone expected, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, the biggest population is now down in the in the south of England, yeah. in the Chilterns, and, and into the surrounding areas. And there's there's thousands of breeding pairs there now. Um, so they've done really well. And at the other populations, the more recent ones, they are now increasing and spreading, becoming a much more common and uh, you know widespread bird. So why were there such great efforts to return the red kite to the skies of the UK? Did they play a particular role in our ecosystem? There wasn't so much about the ecosystem. I suppose it was um, partly, got to be honest, it's such a spectacular, impressive bird of prey. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, it's popular with the public and that does kind of come into it. And, um, and it's easier to get funding for projects that involve spectacular, high-profile birds. Um, but it's... Um, you know, it was a rare bird at the time. It, uh, it's rich, restricted entirely to Europe. Yeah. There are perhaps only 15, 20,000 pairs okay. in the world. It might sound like a lot, but for a, for a bird of prey, it's not a huge population. And it, they were restricted in Britain following persecution over the centuries to just a small population in central Wales, just a few tens of pairs. Yeah. So it was seen as a priority um, and, you know, sorting getting a population back in England and Scotland would really help the, the, the population uh, and help the bird itself. And in general, the public certainly did get on board. Each year, thousands of people travel to red kite feeding centres, such as here at Gig Green Farm, to have a close encounter with a bird that's been absent from the skies for many people's lifetimes. Here at Gig Green Farm, up to 600 red kites can be seen visiting daily feast on the fresh, human-grade meat provided by the farm. You may even catch a glimpse of the rare leucistic white kite. And in 2007, the red kite was awarded the title of the People of Wales's favourite bird. While many people have celebrated seeing a sky full of kites, not everyone has the same feeling. 44% of people have concerns with the unprecedented growth in red kite populations. And while there is support for official red kite feeding centres, 48% of people have concerns about the feeding of red kites from residential gardens. Such has been the success of the various release projects that is now quite common for people to be feeding red kites in their garden, something that would have been inconceivable just a few decades ago. So if people want to help their local populations and want to feed their local red kites, are there any guidelines they need to follow? Yeah, I think it's just common sense, really. I mean, it can cause problems. Um, it's often not necessarily popular with, with neighbours who might not appreciate large birds of prey floating yeah. over the garden. They might worry about their, their pets or, or the worry about songbirds. Sometimes there have been issues with the kites picking up um, scraps of meat and then dropping them on the next door neighbour's oh, right. um, Mercedes or BMW. <laughs> yeah, and that yeah. doesn't always go down too no, well. And, and the food, if it's left out, it, it can attract other things. So it can attract crows and maybe rats even, which doesn't always go down too well. So there can be issues. I suppose it's just common sense. You know, maybe talk to neighbours. Um, feed the right kind of things and maybe just in small amounts. Um, so yeah, you are getting the benefits of the kites coming down into the garden, taking the food, and that can be really, really spectacular. Yeah. They will dive right down into gardens, quite small gardens, grab the food, fly off. It is a spectacular sight, but maybe just small amounts. Um, and yeah, do talk, talk to your neighbors about it to make sure they're okay with it. Concerns have been raised that garden feeding will have a detrimental effect on the red kite's health. 
So to what extent is supplementary garden feeding a threat to the red kite? But people also have concerns about the increase in red kite population numbers. So what are these concerns and are they justified? So what food is being provided to the red kite from the UK's residential gardens? Well, it's good to see that the most common food provided is raw, fresh, unprocessed meats, while others are providing raw processed meats. Cooked meats, carrion, roadkill, pet food, and shop-bought raptor food. But most concerning is that 23% of people are providing general food waste, including pies, bread, and chips. It's encouraging to see that most people are providing a natural diet for the red kite. Although caution must be exerted when providing carry on a roadkill, as raptors are at high risk of secondary rodenticide poisoning. As scavenging raptors, the red kite has developed a sophisticated digestive system that allows it to maximise the nutritional value of poor quality foods. Therefore, a small amount of scraps is unlikely to do any harm. However, in order to achieve optimal health, red kites need a diet rich in skin, bones and meat, as growth and bone disorders have been linked to young red kites on an unsuitable diet lacking in calcium and nutrients. One of the most common concerns is that garden feeding will lead to dependency on human handouts, therefore slowing the red kite's natural dispersal to other parts of the country. Reintroduced and some wild-fledged red kites are fitted with coloured tags that make them easier to identify in the field and to monitor their distribution. Left-wing tag colours indicate the area of release, while the colour on the right tag indicates the year of release. The number on the tag identifies the individual bird. The tag on this bird, Bird 99, indicates that it was released or fledged in Wales in 2007 or 2016, the latter being most likely due to the kite's average lifespan of 10 years. It is through the reported sightings of tagged kites that many have been observed to disperse to other regions of the UK, while others have travelled some huge distances overseas to Ireland and mainland Europe. One Scottish release bird even found its way to Iceland in 1997. Red kites are philopatric, and most will stay within proximity of their nest or release site for life, which explains the higher population densities in reintroduction areas. However, evidence suggests that philopatry is increased in areas with previous successful breeding and availability of food resources. Therefore, there may be some truth in the fact that in areas with high levels of supplementary garden feeding, may see slower rates of dispersal. Aircraft collisions with birds are not uncommon, and of course they can have deadly consequences for aircraft and crew. But will garden feeding really result in more aircraft collisions with red kites? Well, perhaps not on a national basis, but red kites near RAF Benson have been involved in increasing numbers of collisions with military aircraft. So why were the red kites here causing such a problem? People living near the base are being blamed for encouraging the red kites to gather in the area by feeding them scraps. They're now being urged to stop giving them food or risk lives. As a result, the Ministry of Defence were given permission to cull three red kites every year. Now of course, this is only a tiny percentage of the UK's red kite population, but any loss is a sad loss. So if you do live near an airfield, it's probably best not to entice the red kites to your garden. Just enjoy watching these graceful birds from afar. Since the return of the kite, claims have been made about a decline in common buzzard populations. So would a red kite outcompete Britain's most successful raptor? They won't outcompete them. I would say, I think if you've got an area with loads of kites, yeah. then because often the, the two birds are feeding on similar things, so they'll both take earthworms and they'll both scavenge at times. So I think if you've got a lot of kites, maybe the carrying capacity for your buzzards is going to be a bit less. But what won't happen is kites will completely outcompete buzzards. So, you know, so the two species can coexist perfectly well, but yeah. Possibly if you've got more kites, you might expect slightly fewer buzzards. So there, there might be a bit of an effect there. Twenty percent of people feel that the red kite is a danger to livestock, people and our beloved pets. 
with 34% of people feeling that the red kite is already becoming a pest for swooping down on people to grab an easy meal. Others say they feel intimidated by the presence of large flocks of red kites flying above their homes as they've heard stories of red kite attacks. It's important to note that no one surveyed had actually reported having any personal experience of a so-called red kite attack. So where do these concerns about attacks on pets, people and livestock come from? Red kites have had a bit of bad press in some areas, with garden feeders being blamed quite a lot. Um, so can I just draw your attention to some headlines, um, some of which you've probably already seen, and tell me what you think about them. Toddler attacked over custard cream as red kites terrorise Henley on Thames. Do-gooders obsessed with increasing population of avian predators are letting killer birds terrorise our countryside and attack our pets. School children attacked by red kites in playground. Hitchcock Horror and Henley on Thames, red kites terrorise town by attacking people and snatching their food. Bird of prey twice swooped on my handbag dog and tried to snatch it in Berkshire Park. Would a red kite attack a person or a dog or are they simply just trying to swoop in for a nearby food source? Are these headlines justified? So I think it's like the usual media, I'm afraid, I and mean, we get yeah. it with, with other, other wildlife all, all the time, things like spiders and wasps and foxes. It's just sort of grossly exaggerated. So, I mean, what they will do is, it, because they're not particularly wary of people, they will dive down to take um, scraps from gardens, often quite close to people. And there have been reports where kids in the school playground, I think, um, reported that his sort of hand was scratched. Yeah. when a kite came down to try and grab grab his sandwich and you know that is that that that's that's not impossible i mean i don't know to what extent that might have been exaggerated but if that has happened it's not the kite attacking the boy to try and get the food it's just in a mistake when he's when it's trying to come down and grab the food so again i think it's about common sense and yeah. um but certainly in terms of kites coming and taking people's dogs and taking <laughs> sheep from the fields, that sort of thing, that is just all real exaggeration and oh. overblown in the press, I'm afraid. Red kites do engage in food piracy, which could explain the reason for red kites swooping down on pets and people. As you can see here, red kites swooping down on the crows to try and flush them away from a nearby food source. But as Ian says, this is not an attack, and any contact with people or pets is purely a mistake. And watch the cat in the top right corner. The red kite would much prefer an easy meal than attack our beloved pets. As specialist carrion feeders, red kites prefer smaller pieces of food that it can carry to consume elsewhere, or that it can eat on the wing. Although red kites will consume live prey, this is usually in the form of earthworms, young birds and young rabbits. Anything larger will be extremely rare. Garden feeding in itself appears to pose very little threat to the red kite, providing common sense is used and a suitable diet is provided. If you do want to entice these majestic birds to your garden, then a fresh, natural diet will always be best, and any scraps should be kept to a minimum. What originally led to the kite's demise in the UK was a change in public perception that saw the red kite regarded as a pest. Perhaps what's most concerning is that we are at risk of this happening again, if uneducated, sensationalist media reports continue to portray the red kite as vicious killers out to terrorise our towns and steal our pets, which is simply not the case. These are simply just majestic, acrobats of the sky behaving naturally and trying to survive. After decades of persecution at the hands of us humans. My suggestion is to visit a red kite feeding centre to observe these birds in all their glory. You will not be disappointed. If we all get to know, love and understand the red kite, then hopefully there will forever be a sky full of kites.